Um, so again, uh, just to kind of uh, repeat a little bit of, about my background, uh, I have my bachelor's in science and architecture from UNLV uh, in 2006. Um, there I was a national director for AIAS, and um, upon graduating I actually worked for Google um, on a contract basically traveling the country teaching SketchUp. So a lot of my experience with SketchUp is uh, primarily from my coursework and use of it in architecture school, um, mostly from my second year studio uh, through fourth year. And then uh, obviously my professional uh, use of it. After I uh, was dealt with my contract at Google, basically uh, either wanted to start on my own with all the clients and uh, sort of networking that I had, or go work for an architecture firm. and. Uh, at the time, really no architecture firms were hiring. It was the worst time in the economy. So uh, I figured, why not start my own business? And uh, basically, we been providing uh, uh, 3D modeling and rendering services as a design consultant to architecture firms, exhibit designers, uh, solar companies, a um, little bit of everything. Uh, also do a lot of SketchUp training, uh, which is uh, really what I'm more passionate about. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and uh, give you guys a little introduction and some advanced uh, sort of workflow with SketchUp. Um, so who, like, I'm just trying to figure out um, in this audience here what background everybody is. So, um, you know, any architecture students here? Mostly architecture students. Any other majors? All architecture. Sure. Landscape. Okay. So all architecture, good. We're all we're all um, saying the same thing here. That's good. Um, and what years are everybody? Second year, third year, first year, fifth year, fifth year. So, and who's used SketchUp before? <laughs> good, 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 good. Um, so I mean, just to sort of, uh, I'll go through a couple workflow examples that I like to teach. But I really want to open up uh, sort of the last half hour um, to answer some of your questions. I'd like to you know, go around and, and really offer um, my opinion on, on any of the work that you guys are, are working on. I know a lot of you have your laptops, so um, I'm definitely here all day to answer any questions that you have. Um, any questions, I guess, before I get into my uh, spiel here? No. All right, so did everybody download the files on the on the server here? So uh, maybe I should open that myself. All right, so what I have in the advanced uh, workshop here is uh, basically two examples. One is importing from AutoCAD. Has anybody done this process? Importing from AutoCAD? Just a few? A couple. A couple nods. Um, so if you're, if you're using SketchUp Pro, so uh, SketchUp Pro allows you to import and export uh, DWG files. This example, is, I'm going to go through that process. If you don't, you can actually just start with this file here, this uh, SketchUp file that I have. The other example that I want to show you is a, is a good technique that's really uh, that already looked at a lot in SketchUp, and that's called photo match. Does anybody know a photo match in SketchUp? Just two? Okay. So photo match is a great little feature. It allows you to uh, basically take a photograph of a building, so take a, the sort of corner of the building, and using the photograph and just using some measurements that you have maybe on site, you can actually just recreate the model as a photo texture model. Uh, that you can drop into Google Earth. You can also, um, I use it a lot as uh, reference to maybe an adjacent building that I'm actually designing. So if it's an existing structure and you're trying to build something next to it, it really helps give uh, some context as well as uh, when you're aligning a photograph or aligning your building into a photograph in Photoshop, it really takes out a lot of that uh, uh, tough work that you have to do in Photoshop to really align your perspectives and align uh, the vanishing points. <clears throat> so I guess we'll get started here just with the, the CAD import here. What version of SketchUp is everybody using here? Are, are you still on SketchUp 8? Any 13s? 
Okay. So if you're still on SketchUp 8, there's really not much of a difference between 8 and 13. Uh, just so you know the sort of history, SketchUp used to be owned by Atlas Software. Google bought them in 2006, 2007, and then just recently sold them in the last year and a half to Trimble. And Trimble's a big uh, uh, GIS sort of navigation technology sort of company. Um, so in that, SketchUp 2013 is sort of Trimble's uh, stamp on it. And they just really just sort of changed the icons and not really much else has, has been affected. Um, so let's just go through this uh, sort of workflow here. I'm just going to close out the uh, SketchUp template here. Now if you have SketchUp Pro, who has SketchUp Pro again? A couple people. All right. So I'll just walk through this quickly. And then that way, everybody who doesn't have it can uh, keep up. So anytime you import a AutoCAD file into SketchUp, you first need to find, obviously, the location of the file. So I just went to File Import, going to the Advanced Workshop folder in CAD Import Example. Make sure your file type is set up as DWG, and I think. Is everybody, we have some PC users, some Mac users, is that right? Some PC. Wouldn't it be better if you turn down the lights? Uh, yeah, we can turn down. Yeah, we can turn down a little bit. I think they can read better. See a little bit better? Yeah. Well, I'll try it and you tell me if. There's a light control. Oh, it is over there. So the interface is a little bit different on a Mac than it is on a PC. Um, but there's just a, a couple of main things that I want to uh, make sure I show you here. Uh, one, one error most people have when they first import an AutoCAD file is it imports, but the scale's off. So what was 12 inches is actually 12 feet, and that's because of an import option. So before you select the DWG file that you import, make sure you go to Options. Now, by default, if you just installed SketchUp, this is what it looks like straight out of the box. So um, merge coplanar faces, this has to do with if there's actual 3D geometry from the DWD file. It just makes sure all of them are merged so you don't have like triangulated faces that make up the same plane. Uh, orient faces consistently is, again, 3D uh, geometry from AutoCAD. It just turns outside faces outward and inside faces inward. Not too much to really worry about here. What's critical is your scale. So if your AutoCAD file is in inches, which 90% um, of the time the files I'm working on are in inches, you want to make sure you set that as inches. The last critical thing to show here, this is a good little trick. Let's say you're importing AutoCAD files a lot, like maybe you're using it as a reference and um, you know, a week goes by and you have an updated CAD plan. If you click Preserve Drawing Origin, that remembers where the UCS is in AutoCAD, or your 00, zero point, and it just references that to the 00, zero point in SketchUp. So the next time you import uh, this CAD file, it's going to import on the exact same location. So I can click OK, and then you can click Open. You'll get a little import results here. So this just tells you all the information that SketchUp imports. Uh, SketchUp doesn't import uh, XRefs, so you need to bind them or um, put them part of the file. It doesn't import text or hatches, so um, it really just sort of imports the, the straight geometry that you have here. So you go ahead and click Close, and you'll see the start of the SketchUp file sort of uh, imported here. And the first thing that I always like to do is just do a zoom extents, which it's this tool down here in the bottom left. It's also keyboard shortcut is Shift Z. That does a zoom extents for you. Now, for those of you who don't have um, uh, SketchUp Pro, just go ahead and, and open the CAD Residence DWG imported file, and that'll get you. Um, at the same uh, spot that we are here. So a couple of you have done this process before, but what was uh, your biggest challenge or what was usually like your next step that you do here? Um, 
right? So you can delete the lines that you don't need. What about the layers? What do you usually do with your layers here? Okay. And you use those layers to help organize your sketchup model? Okay. So, um, yeah, one is definitely delete the layers that you don't need. So, a real critical thing I want to show you here is layers in SketchUp don't act the same way that layers do in AutoCAD. So, layers in AutoCAD control visibility and geometry because everything's 2D, so you can sort of turn and highlight things off. Whereas in the 3D environment in SketchUp, layers only control visibility. So to control geometry in SketchUp, you need to make things groups or components. And <clears throat> just to kind of give you an example of that, um, what, I, what my workflow typically is, is I'll turn off the layers that you know, I don't need or don't want to show. Uh, in this case, we can actually just keep all these layers here because um, I removed all the layers that I didn't want in AutoCAD before uh, importing the file. Um, typically the workflow then I'll do is, is purge all of these layers and just have them on layer zero. And then I'll create a layer for the plan and the elevation just as one uh, element. And the reason for that is if you have geometry over here that's just sort of individual geometry, and you go and make certain objects of those onto a different layer. So let's say I move this to a anonote. Look what happens when you start to extrude geometry and then turn off different elements. You get sort of this um, usually on a Mac, and this is my travel PC, so you have to apologize for my uh, changes. So see what happens there when you turn that on to a different layer? You get this kind of Swiss cheese effect, and it's really going to affect your model, so anytime that you uh, create geometry in SketchUp and you want to use layers, just remember that layers in SketchUp are only controlling visibility. Uh, We'll go through this workflow of this uh, simple house here and create groups, assign them to layers to hold control visibility, and then we'll model and build from that. So with the file open here, uh, what I'd like to do is go into a top view. And if you don't have this toolbar up here, this views toolbar, you can go to view toolbars and select the the use tool set. On a Mac, it's a little bit different. Um, and this is typically the, the toolbar set that I like. But on a Mac, you have to, sorry. On a Mac, you have to go to um, view. Sorry. You have to go to view, customize toolbar, all the way at the bottom. And then it's going to bring up this tool palette that you can basically drag all the tools that you want up in the model. So in this case, the top right now by default is going to have a lot of your getting started drawing tools. You can actually drag those out. You'll see a little like trash can sort of effect or paper that's sort of uh, spinning out. At the top of the toolbars on a Mac and same with the PC, I always try to keep the uh, face styles and the view styles up top. And then on the left is just your large tool set. So your large tool set is all the drawing tools that you'll ever need in SketchUp. Don't worry too much about getting all the tools set up because uh, time is short, so I want to make sure I get through uh, most of this here. So <clears throat> what I want to do here is just create a simple massing model and just show you some of the techniques 
that I do to kind of extrude walls. Um, uh, for some of you, what's usually your next step here? Do you actually go through and trace all the line work? Any nods? Yes. And that, that is a, a certain way that you can, you can actually start creating a lot of the walls. The challenge with doing this is there'll be elements, depending on how you created your CAD file, there'll be walls that if you don't have solid uh, ending points, like here, you'll spend a lot of time just tracing over a line and not create the face. And that's because something subtle as this little uh, ending point here is preventing you from closing that loop or closing that edges there. I don't really prefer tracing this. It's a lot, it's a, it's a headache. You have to basically recreate all of your geometry. But then also when you start to extrude elements, any break in that segment, so in this case the break of the stairs here, it's going to extrude that line work up. So it creates another step for us to actually come through with the eraser and erase all that geometry. So I'm just going to undo and show you sort of the process that I prefer going through. And that is, again, purging all of your layers first, grouping your floor plan, grouping your elevation, and then drawing on top of the floor plan here. So in your layers palette, I'm going to keep layer zero active here up at the top. I'm just going to select with shift all the other layers. I'm going to click the minus sign. And you have three options. You can move the content to the default layer. Um, you can move it to the current layer, which is the same thing. Or you can delete the contents. In this case, we just want to move it to the default layer and click OK. That essentially purges all of our uh, CAD layers so that everything is now just on layer zero. I'm going to click on that top view. Delete the stuff over here that we don't need. And I'm going to select a window around this from left to right to select the entire floor plan here. <clears throat> With that selected, make sure you right click on the selection. Notice on my cursor, if I just right click out here in model space, it just deselects. Make sure when you right click, you're actually selecting on uh, some sort of entity or geometry of the file. And make this a group. Same thing with the elevation. Select the window from left to right. Right click on it. And make this a group. In the layers palette, I'm going to add a layer. This is going to be called plan. And I'll add another layer called elevation. So you can just do that with the little plus sign up there. Now, it's sort of a stupid uh, feature of SketchUp, and I, I don't get it, but this layer palette, this is where you create layers and you turn them on and off, but it isn't where you actually assign geometry to your layer. So I can't just select this and click the elevation layer. It doesn't move that geometry to that layer. Instead, you either have to bring up uh, window entity info, Or there's a, there's a little tool palette that you could bring up. And typically, I just uh, I disregard this tool palette. I just use the uh, entity info, just a little bit easier. So go ahead and select that geometry. And in entity info, go ahead and just uh, assign that or bring the drop down to the actual layer that you want it on. So in this case, you can put it on the plan layer, or you can uh, then select the elevation and put that on the elevation layer. So select here, put this on plan, select this one, put this on elevation. So now, all the geometry is on 
all the internal geometry is still always drawn on layer zero. But if I want to control the visibility, let's say I want to turn off the plan, I can turn it off here. Same with the elevation. All right, so next step is we're going to rotate the elevation up so that we can actually start to extrude the model and then um, use it as a reference. So any idea how we uh, rotate that? Rotate tool, right? right. Well, it's, it's still early, but get some feedback from you guys. So does anybody use the rotate tool in SketchUp? So <clears throat> I didn't know this uh, using SketchUp, but Let's take a look what happens when I go and use the rotate tool. So first, let's pre-select the elevation. And I've used this tool before, so let's do what I've done in the past, just click the rotate tool. Notice that the scale, that it's, or the angle that it's on, it's on the blue axis, so it's on this uh, sort of ground plane. If I go to rotate this, so I'm trying to flip this up, I can't do it because it's only allowing me to rotate this on this blue plane. Anybody know how to, to work around this? Change the axis. Right, how would you do that? Um, I normally like draw a cube and then... Draw a little box over to the side. Yep. So there's two ways that you can do this. The way that I always used to do this is exactly uh, your way. Since there's no 3D geometry in here, we don't have an axis to kind of pivot from. So what I'll do is usually just draw a little box over here and push pull that up. Then pre-select the uh, group here. Take the rotate tool. And now you'll notice that the, uh, the axis shifts based off of the orientation of the box. So once you find the red axis, which is what we want here, you can hold down shift. Actually, if you look at the bottom here, <coughs> bless you. It says uh, hold shift to align to face. <clears throat> so once you find the red axis, hold down shift. And now when you move your cursor, it locks you in that red axis. Now the critical point here, um, I, not only just aligning to this axis, but to save a step from having to move the elevation up or down, make sure you rotate it on the finished floor line. That way you don't have to move it uh, in reference to the plan. So the finished floor line is right here. And the rotate tool is three clicks. So the first click sets the origin point. The second click is just your reference angle, so this can kind of be anywhere, and usually I just make it on the, uh, the green axis here. So I'll click again. Your third click determines your angle, and you can either type in your angle, so I could type in 90 and press enter, or if you move your cursor closer to the um, protractor here, you'll feel it snap every 15 degrees, or, yeah, every 15 degrees. And then you can click and set that. So that's the way that I used to do this for a good three, four years, until I realized um, there's, a, there's a little built-in trick with the rotate tool. So let me undo. <clears throat> and the trick is, after you pre-select your elevation, and you click the rotate tool. Remember the first click sets the origin point. Instead of click and releasing this first click, just click and hold. So I'm holding on my mouse right now, holding on my left uh, key. And as you're holding, move your cursor out and you can see the, uh, basically see the protractor rotate in whatever angle that you specify. So in this case, I'm gonna find the red axis and then release. And that is essentially your first click. Your second click, again, can be anywhere in the green axis here. So I'll just click once. And then your third click, you can either type in 90 
or uh, click once you get to 90. Anybody able to do that? Everybody's following along? All right, so the next thing we're going to do, I'm going to show you a couple of techniques to do the interior, and then uh, I'll show you a couple of techniques for the, uh, for the exterior. So for the interior, now that we have the plan as a group, we have it on a layer. I want to make sure I don't delete this. I just want to use it as a reference. I'm sort of using this, uh, AutoCAD's terms, I'm sort of using this like an extra. Uh, what you can do is right click and lock the group. This is going to prevent you, if you try to double click, it's going to prevent you from opening the group. It's going to prevent you from accidentally deleting it. But since we uh, assigned it to a layer, you can see that we can still turn it on and off. If you need to unlock a group, uh, just simply right click and select unlock. Now there's a couple ways that we can build this model. And one is using the line tool, we could take the line tool and trace around uh, the perimeter of the building. But again, that, that sort of, it takes a lot of time. You gotta make sure you're on each sort of little endpoint. What I prefer doing is uh, using the rectangle tool. Let's go ahead and click on the rectangle tool. It's also shortcut R. And I'm gonna start in this, top left corner here, and I'm going to use the rectangle tool and just basically draw the shapes of the model here. So start there, draw it to this point here, and then draw this last sort of section where the living room and dining room are. Here we're going to just draw this little cutout. And that way you have basically the shell of the building sort of uh, traced out. And if I'm moving a little too fast, let me know. I can slow it down a little bit. Feel free to speak up, ask questions. I'm here all day. All right, so with the shell sort of uh, drawn out, I want to create all the exterior walls. But before I do that, you'll see from creating the three boxes, well, in this case four, uh, let's turn off the plan layer here. Let, let's take the eraser and just erase these internal and then these two external edges to get us the perimeter of the entire house. While we're here, anybody have to figure out area calculations for a building? Nod, say yes. Yes, I know how much area the building is. <clears throat> so uh, have, you, have you done it in SketchUp? A couple people? All right, so area tool in SketchUp, for those of you who don't know, uh, you can right click on any face and go to area and then click selection. So this is a quick way to understand the exact area of any face in SketchUp. Now I'm just gonna undo real quick to get it back to these sort of three spaces. Just note that you can also add to your selection uh, to do area calculations. So you select and hold down shift I select these three faces and then right click and go to area selection, it's going to give you that same amount. You can also see the area uh, in the entity info here. So if you notice here, um, if I just click the two faces, it's going to give me my area calculation there. If I just click the one face, it's going to give me my area there. It's really helpful and useful, especially when you're trying to figure out you know, individual areas for, for um, rooms, but then also trying to figure out total area and square footage. 
Um, it's also great. Uh, I, I do uh, a lot of work using uh, getting locations from Google Earth and then just figuring out how big a site is. So <clears throat> there's a feature where you can go to File, Get Location, and then you can basically search Google Maps and it imports a view right into SketchUp. Um, but you can basically trace whatever your site plan is and, and get a quick uh, location of how, how big that is. Back to our model here. So we have <clears throat> we have the shell of the building. Let's click the plan back on. And most of the exterior walls are uh, generally the same thickness. So I'm just going to start in the corner here. And I'm going to take the offset tool. Anybody use the offset tool in AutoCAD? Anybody use it in SketchUp? A couple? All right, so if you use it in AutoCAD, it's not like it is in SketchUp. In AutoCAD, you would click offset, and then you would click on the edge, and then move in or out. SketchUp, however, when you use the offset tool, it recognizes the face and not the edges. So you'll notice I'm hovering over the face here, and it gives you this little um, red square. That's your sort of reference uh, edge. What you want to do there is just click once to start your offset. And then here you can either uh, offset inward, obviously, or offset outward, depending on uh, how you move your cursor. In this case, we want to offset inward, and that's five and a half inches. Now, just as a side note, just to show you a trick. Let's say you have a doorway here and you want to offset trim, and you go to offset, see how it's offsetting all four edges? To offset only three edges in SketchUp, you need to pre-select. So take the select tool, hold down shift, and select the three edges, and then use offset. And in that case, it'll just offset the edges that you select. Uh, the, the edges have to be connected, so um, you know you can have like a random uh, pattern here, but they all have to be selected. So I couldn't just offset those three edges. I need to select this edge as well. So we got the edges offset. Let's go ahead and take push pull. Just P, your keyboard shortcut. And let's push pull this first floor up. And what we're going to do, since we have the elevation here, let's just go ahead and infer. Um, let's infer to this point here. So it's uh, 9 feet, 5 and a quarter. Uh, I'm not going to be concerned about getting this height correct. Let's just get it pretty close. But it's a nice feature you can infer to your elevation or any, or any geometry as you're push pulling. So as I mentioned, most of the exterior walls are all five and a half inches. But over here in the living room area, they're actually a little bit thicker. And you can see that here. And a good way to double check this, um, if you bring up the styles menu in SketchUp, so on a PC that's under view toolbars, styles. Um, on a Mac, you'd have to go to View, Customize Toolbars, and drag up the Styles Tool Palette. Uh, you can also get to it um, under View, Face Styles. What I want you to click is this first one, which is called X-Ray. allows you to see through the model. You can also go to View, uh, Face Style, and then check on X-Ray. The reason why we do this is now we can see through the model and just sort of verify the thicknesses of some of these walls. For example, this wall, I'm just going to push this in until it hits that edge. I'm going to push this in until it hits that edge. Same with this one. To turn off, uh, 
x-ray mode, you simply just need to click the icon. Or, again, view, base styles, just uncheck x-ray. <clears throat> so many of you have gotten to this point before in creating your models, more or less. So what's usually your next step for creating the inside walls? Do you use like the line tool to trace the ground? Do you use a rectangle tool and extrude them up? What's, uh, what do you usually do? Makes it a little challenging. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Any other tips or tricks anybody uses? Yeah. All right. So, the way I, I always first uh, did this prior to having training from SketchUp, which was very helpful, um, and looking at hundreds of video tutorials. Basically, there's a couple ways that you can approach extruding the walls up. Uh, the longest way and the most tedious is using the line tool and, and basically recreating your drawing and you know this is a huge pain it's, it's awful to do it's very time intensive um, the other is using the rectangle tool and just modeling out uh, the elements there and again that's sort of time intensive uh, the trick that I've been doing lately uh, specifically in a building like this where all your walls are the same height. So this isn't going to work on every uh, example. But it's a good starting point and then you can, you know, um, you know, move off from there. But basically the, the trick that I have is since our exterior walls are extruded up to whatever height and our interior walls are going to be that same height, rather than using line a rectangle tool, we're actually going to use move copy and the copy and paste feature. And to do that, and I'll show this and then I'll walk around and uh, uh, give any help as, uh, as you're trying this. To do that, what I'm going to do is select this line here. And you can select any of these vertical, any one vertical line here. And I'm going to just press Control C or Command C on a Mac. And then notice when I hit Control V, See when I paste this line, the inserting point of that line is actually on the edge, on the bottom edge. And what I can do is basically just um, paste multiple uh, copies all around the edge of the model. And as you can tell, I've done this exercise a few times. So moving through this pretty quickly. So again, this is just uh, control V. And you don't have to do the whole thing. This is just, again, just an exercise. Oops. <laughs> but notice what happens when you control V and paste those you now get the separation of the bases here so that now you can push pull your walls out. From here there's a couple ways that you can push pull these. One is I can push pull just to the end point here. And like here I can push just to the end point here. And push this out. And push this all the way down here. Now when you get to uh, intersections like this, where you get to like T intersections or, or L's here, a uh, good little trick is there's, um, there's a copy feature inside of uh, the push-pull tool. So notice when I push-pull this face, it continues my extrusion out to here. As you're push-pulling, if you press the control key or uh, option on a Mac, see how that little really hard to see, but see how that little plus sign comes up? It's the same like move copy. So move, move your objects, move with control, copies your object along whatever movement you're doing. Uh, with with uh, push pull, it copies a new face from that point. So it leaves this line work here, leaves that line there, and then allows us to extrude from the new point. And what that 
basically saves us a step in doing is we can now just push pull this all the way over to where we need it. Now this opening here, there's a little soffit that runs across here. Uh, any tips on what people have done uh, to try and create sort of this soffit here? What is uh, some people uh, workflow when they do this? You use the measuring tape and measure up how high I want and then do a line. Yep. So that's definitely one way. So um, if you take the tape measure tool, make sure that plus sign is checked on. That's with control. You can draw a line up, and let's say this opening is at eight feet. That gives you a guide that you can now draw from. So in this case, the long way to do this is to take the line tool and trace that line from there. Trace another line over. It fills in the top face because it's a closed loop of edges, so you can actually uh, just select them and delete them. And then you can either uh, push pull or use the line tool again to trace your elements. And that is a good way to start, um, but you'll notice it's a lot of click commands, and there's, there's certainly an easier way to do that. And what I usually do, let's uh, review push pull. What I do is a, a combination of move copy. So I'll take the select tool and select this edge that little line right there. Take the move tool, make sure control is clicked. That way it brings up the little plus sign. And copy this line up eight feet. Now all you can do is just take the push pull tool, push pull this to the other edge, and then use the eraser just to clean up some geometry. Anybody use that technique? No? Yes, you guys learned something. Great. <laughs> awesome. All right, here's another technique which I use sometimes as well. So in this case, uh, as we push pull the ex um, exterior walls, instead of stopping here where you have openings, I'm going to push pull this all the way even over your door jams. Let me just have a couple walls here, that way I can show how this works. This one here. All right, so we push pull through one, two, three of these major walls here. And you notice there's a couple um, doorways and then there's a couple uh, openings into the, um, the rooms here. To get this trick to work, uh, you need to actually first delete the ground planes. So I'm just going to take the select tool and I'm going to delete all of the ground planes here. And I'm going to orbit upside down to look underneath the building. And with the rectangle tool, I'm just going to trace over where those openings are. So you have those two there, you have the doorway here, you have this opening here. You can even do outside doors as well. I think I'm missing one. Yep, I'm missing this one here. So after you trace a couple of those, just turn off the plan. And notice a bunch of the openings that I have. So I got a couple there, that one there. I think I'm missing one here, but that's okay. <clears throat> what I can now do is just take push pull, and all these openings are the same height. Let's just say they're all, um, let's say they're all seven feet. So if I push pull this first one uh, down, although we know it's actually pushing up. Uh, if I push pull this seven feet and press enter, remember that push pull 
uh, remembers your last push pull command or your last push pull distance. So I can hover over the next space and just double click and double click and double click and double click and this one as well. Double click. You can go ahead and turn back on the plan. Turn upside down or right side up. And again, you have uh, you have your model, and this is just sort of another way of doing it. Um, to get your ground plane back in, just uh, just trace over one of your edges, and it'll bring that face back in. Uh, I kind of like doing it this way, uh, mainly because it simplifies the geometry. So um, you don't have a lot of straight edges and straight geometry running around your model, and it makes it also easier to um, basically clean up any loose edges here because you don't have as many to clean up. Uh, that becomes critical, especially if you're trying to render this in another program, like if you're trying to bring this into 3D Max or um, do you get what other programs do you guys use to, to model with? Do you use like uh, Maxwell or Rhino or anything? Rhino? Do you model just everything in Rhino and then Okay. Anybody else? Anybody use anything else? No? Technically, yes, but we probably don't want to admit it. Kirk gave the up. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's now that's a standalone application, right? Yeah. Um, but it does have a SketchUp plugin, so you can model from SketchUp. Um, <clears throat> plugin I use a lot to do photorealistic renderings, especially uh, from SketchUp, is one called Podium. Um, basically, in college, I started using Podium because I didn't feel like doing all-nighters watching my model not render right in 3D Max. So, um, Podium was a great way um, to do simple, quick uh, renderings and you know not have to stay up all night, um, like some of my colleagues. Um, so if you stay for the demo uh, uh, or the tech talk uh, um, later, um, I'll show a lot of those examples of uh, a couple of those uh, plugins that I use. <clears throat> Any questions about this process or workflow so far? Wow, it's already new, almost. <clears throat> so let, let's, uh, let's do the other example and show you Photomatch, since many of you haven't used Photomatch. Um, so what I want you to do is just uh, start a new document. And I'll try and go through this um, hopefully in, in uh, just sort of 15 minutes. That way I have the last 15 minutes I can come and answer any questions that you have. I'm sure, uh, or some of you are working with SketchUp on your studio projects right now. A few of you? Do you have questions? Maybe. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this next example is, again, a technique. It's called Photomatch. And just to sort of give you an idea of what we're going to do, I'm going to go into the image folders of uh, Photomatch. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. This is actually uh, of Independence Mall. This is the Free Quaker Meeting House building. Uh, adjacent to it is the visiting center, um, the Independence Hall, and where the Liberty Bell is, is directly on this mall. Um, this is a very simple building, and it's a great example to use Photomatch, where, <clears throat> you know, let's pretend that we're going to build something adjacent to this, which the city would never approve because it's Independence Mall. But um, we want to use this image as context and to get a frame of reference for our new structure that we want to build. And um, <clears throat> if you've had to do that previously, um, you know, you usually sort of take a photo like this and then maybe uh, just do like a quick massing model and sketch up and you're not really too sure of the size and scale or you have to measure uh, the site. Basically, uh, this process with Photomatch really takes out a lot of that, that work. Um, 
using this technique. And we're going to start with this photo here, which is the file is called 01 start photo match. But just to give you an idea, typically when I do photo match examples, I'll try and take corner, straight on corner shots of the building. See the homeless people there? And then also part of that is, um, is importing flat textures. So these were textures taken from those photos, and then they were just cropped in Photoshop. Everybody use Photoshop? Yes, a couple knots. So uh, when you crop a texture, anybody ever cropped uh, with the perspective checked on? You ever seen that little feature? So when you use the crop tool in Photoshop, there's a little checkbox up at the top that says you can crop in perspective. And it will basically take whatever angle you have of the, your four corners and flatten it to a flat image like this, um, which is great to use as a texture that you can just drop right into uh, SketchUp. So that's how something like this was uh, created. This makes it a lot easier to do uh, textures and saves a lot of time from having to detail and model uh, a lot of this information. <clears throat> So in our new file, let's uh, let's go to File Import. Let's go to Photo Match Example. Make sure all supported image types is selected. Go into the Image folder. Now, before you click Open, you have three import options. So um, the interface looks a little different on a Mac. I think it's uh, I think it's a drop down here somewhere. What we want to do, typically when you import textures, you import them as a texture. In this case with photo match, you want to click use as new photo match, or sorry, use as new match photo. There's actually a lawsuit uh, about using the term photo match and match photo. So they had to rename this to say new match photo. Uh, click the first image and then click uh, open. Anyway, I forget, did anybody use this exercise before? Has anybody done this before this one? <clears throat> All right, so um, what we have here, and this is a good exercise um, in two-point perspectives. What we have here is the origin point, which is here, your center little origin point. The yellow line is your horizon line. And <clears throat> if I zoom out a little bit, this point here and this point here are your vanishing points of this photo. And the trick to get this to work is one, you need a building that's rectilinear, so you want to make sure you have a building that's at a true 90 degrees, otherwise this uh, uh, tool won't work. But what you want to do is first move your origin point by click and dragging it and move it to the foreground corner of that building. And you can see the blue axes, that's your z-axis. That lets you know that we're exactly uh, straight on there. The next thing that you want to do is you don't want to move, you don't want to move the vanishing points. Instead, um, I'm assuming all of you have had like a two-point perspective class some, somewhere along the line, right? Do you remember the exercise? No? Yes, you have. Come on. Um, so when you're doing two-point perspectives and you're drawing them out, you, you have reference points or guides that are obviously going to determine where that vanishing point is. And that's what these perspective bars are. So with the two red perspective bars, in this building, I know that the top here is parallel to the bottom shutters here. You don't want to use the ground plane because this ground plane actually slopes down a little bit. So what you want to do is click on the perspective bar here and just click and drag it. And we're essentially aligning or referencing points that we, we think are uh, parallel to each other. So if you notice, if I move those two to the bottom, those two to the top, you can see our vanishing point starts to tail end you know, somewhere around here. Do the same thing with the green axes. We'll use the top. Now you can get really precise if you want to really zoom in here, but it's only a guide. You, you don't have to spend a lot of time you know, getting the point sort of correct. Um, just get it close, and then once you have it close, you can tweak and adjust it 
accordingly. All right, so there's two ways that you can sort of verify that the um, vanishing points and lines are all set up. One is take a look at the blue axes. Now, if the line is sort of off center, so it's really subtle or hard to see here, but if it's off like that, see how my edge is here? What you want to do is just take the perspective bar and just or take any of these um, perspective bars and just adjust them slightly, just to get that a little bit closer. <clears throat> and that'll adjust it. And just the other way to sort of verify this is uh, remember where you took the photo. And if you have a person in the photo, take a look at where the horizon line is. Now, I was sitting uh, a little bit lower where I took this shot, but notice the horizon line is pretty much uh, at eye level uh, with this guy here who was walking by. You know, if this was up a lot higher, you, you know, it, it would certainly uh, be off there. But that's, that's sort of a good uh, frame of mind to, to look at. Once you have the perspective bar set up, <clears throat> in the match photo palette here, you can click done. And the first thing that people try to do is try to orbit in a photo. And notice how you lose your photo. Uh, don't worry about that. Just click on, you'll see it creates a scene. So if you click back on that scene tab, it's going to reposition the photo and reposition your axes uh, to draw from. Next, just take the line tool. And it's always important when you're drawing a photo match, always begin from that origin point. And what I'm going to do is just take the line tool and go along the red axes to here. And I'm just sort of eyeballing this. I'm going to draw to here. I'm going to go back to the axis point here. And then back down. You'll see that face, uh, that sort of translucent uh, face is created. And by orbit, you can kind of see that in 3D. Nothing impressive yet. This is just simple. You get it. Uh, what you can do now is take the push-pull tool and push-pull this space back to right around where the edge of the building aligns to. So again, if we orbit, Okay, we got a box, that's cool. Now, <clears throat> where this um, gets really nice, or where it's uh, really interesting, is if you take the select tool and select the front face, uh, right click on the front face and select project photo. And do the same thing on the left face here, right click and project photo. So now when I orbit, it essentially stamps the photo as a texture now on those two faces. With it as a projected texture, if I take the line tool and draw from midpoint to midpoint, and take the move tool and just move this line up, line here, you'll see that that texture projects and stays with the face of the model. So I can move this up in the blue axis approximately where the height is, right there. So 
Empire State Bed. So <clears throat> this texture is kind of ugly because um, what happens when you project a texture uh, in PhotoMatch, the closer you get to the vanishing point, the more distorted the photo is. So if you look at um, you know, this corner detail versus <clears throat> what the texture looks like down here, it gets much, much more distorted here because you're projecting it and you're, you're spreading the, the pixels out. Uh, so, we <clears throat> so what we want to do is just replace this texture. And you can do that by using uh, File Import. I go to Textures in that folder. <clears throat> There's a, the texture called Side 1. Make sure here, though, that you don't use, use as new match photo, but that you use as texture. Go ahead and click open. And you can click on the, uh, when you import textures, it always starts in the bottom left hand corner. So you can click here to start your import. And um, a little trick when you're importing textures, uh, <clears throat> the X and Y of this was a little bit taller than the actual model. Um, so right now it's, it's locking the proportion as I'm importing this. But if you ever import textures and you need to break uh, that lock, you'll see at the bottom here that uh, sorry shift equals non-uniform. If I find this endpoint here and I hold down shift, you'll see how I can break that and sort of set it to how I want it to be. Now I have that roof texture there as well, so let's go to File, Import, and import the this shingle file here. And then we'll use the paint bucket. <clears throat> uh, if you ever use a paint bucket, you can hold down Alt, or uh, I think it's Alt on a piece and on a Mac as well. Either all or option, I can't remember. If I sample this texture, I can now paste it over here. And same with this texture. If I want to sample this, I can apply it to the back. So we have this model <clears throat> sort of done in PhotoMatch, but we don't have it geolocated. We want to actually plot this right in Philadelphia, right on the uh, on Independence Mall there, because we want to then kind of make a building next to it to draw from. Uh, anybody use the get geolocation feature in SketchUp? Just one? So <clears throat> I'll go through this feature, because it, it really is a, a, a great feature, and it's updated a lot in the last couple of years. Um, before, if you wanted to get a location from Google Earth, you would actually have to have Google Earth downloaded on your um, on your computer. You'd have to have the view set up in Google Earth, and then you have to click on an icon in SketchUp that would get that location and then uh, stamp it on there. And it would only be a grayscale image. Uh, since SketchUp eight, uh, you don't have to have Google Earth on your computer. Instead, uh, you can do this process here, which you can follow along. You go to File, Geolocation. Go ahead and click Add Location. And it basically brings up a Google Map uh, interface here. And I'm just going to type in Philadelphia, PA. It's a uh, zoom out. Uh, you could also type it's uh, 5th and Arch Street, Philadelphia, PA. Uh, just to give you a frame of reference, so here's the building that we modeled. Here's where the Liberty Bell's held. Uh, or no, here's where the Liberty Bell's held. Independence Mall, or Independence Hall. The Mint, and the Constitution Center. <clears throat> so when you import um, 
uh, location data from, from this map interface. You want to make sure that you're not zoomed in too close because you won't have much in context. But at the same point, you don't want to be zoomed out too far that the pixel or the, the texture of it is so um, um, pixelated that you, know, you can't really view it. And um, you can also you can import multiple uh, frames. So if you're doing a huge site, like uh, say you're trying to do all of campus, you would certainly have to uh, snapshot a bunch of locations here. Um, something like this size or even one out here is a, is a good size here. You can go ahead and click Select Region. And this brings up these uh, push pins. And this is basically just providing an area um, in which you'll crop the image. So if you want to keep this uh, rectangular, you can. If you want this to be more square, which is what I'll, I'll do here. Have it like so. Go ahead and click Grab, top right. And it snapshots that photo and then plops it into the model. Not only does it plop it into the model, but it plops it into scale. And it plops in, um, it's very generic, but it plops in the terrain data. Um, Philly's relatively flat, so you won't see much in the terrain here. But if I click on the Google Earth terrain layer, um, to show you hidden geometry, no, it doesn't even help. This is really flat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it does bring in that data. Um, it's relatively accurate, but it's going to give you a very low poly count, so it's not going to be very um, um, detailed. So we have our house in here, and as we um, as we built this, we didn't build this really to any scale, but we can use the footprint of it to actually um, uh, to locate this. So I'm just going to select all of it, right click and make it a group just so that it's easier to move. I like to group objects often and um, usually um, as soon as possible. And what you can do now is uh, take the scale tool, which is this tool right here, and you can scale this and make sure you're scaling from one of the diagonal points. But I can scale this up and then take the move tool and just move it over a little bit. Uh, one of the other challenges whenever you're using Google Earth image data, uh, take a look at the building. See how, off, how skewed it is? Based off of wherever the airplane was or uh, some of these, they do low-level planes. Others, they do satellite imagery. Depending on the angle of that, um, it's going to uh, skew the, the model here. So right now, if we were to place this where the footprint or where the uh, uh, roof is shown, it's actually halfway in the street. And that's because of the angle of the photo. So what you need to do is just sort of find a balance between um, you know, where it is and sort of move it over, that way it's, it's correctly in place. Um, another great thing just about uh, um, uh, getting location is if you go to model info, and go to geolocation. <clears throat> you can set a manual location. You can. Uh, it gives you the exact latitude and longitude. If you're doing uh, sun studies, you can go to window shadows. And when you turn on shadows, these are accurate shadows based off of um, this exact latitude and longitude. By default, if you just bring this right from SketchUp, the default location is Boulder, Colorado. And that's where SketchUp was uh, is from. It's basically started. Um, so these are more accurate. But um, <clears throat> does anybody do solar studies for any of their models? One, couple hands. So there's a really great plugin 
uh, if you're trying to put solar panels on, some, some contract work that I do is actually for a solar company. There's this plugin, uh, I think I have it here. I'll just show it real quick. Yeah. There's this plugin called uh, Scalion. Scalion. And what it does is, um, after you locate your model, um, let's go to a top view. And let's select these two front faces. Let's say I want to put solar panels on these two faces here. With this plugin, you can click on this insert solar components. And part of this plugin allows you to actually determine um, all the information that you want for uh, the panels that you're putting here. Everything from the relative tilt. You can actually define your own solar panels. So client I work with uses um, a solar panel by a company called uh, Green Jordans. So it actually has the, the data, the power, the weight. You can adjust the spacing between panels. Um, as well, if you're pitching them, you can, you can pitch them at sort of worst case scenarios. And then once you click continue, it's basically going to plop the panels onto the building um, you know, in whatever location that you, you specify. Let's try that one more time. Uh, it should have more panels here. This should do another row. <clears throat> Aside from just creating the uh, panels here, um, any of you familiar with PV watts or NREL? So PV watts is basically um, the database that um, NREL uses to help calculate um, Solar calculations. Yes. Bad way of saying it, but um, anyway, it links uh, all this research data, and you could go on PV Watts website and actually uh, plug in all this data. But instead, this uses your model data, puts in all that information, and calculates. Oh, there's a couple groups. That's fine. So it calculates and does a full sort of uh, uh, spreadsheet analysis of uh, the site based off of um, that latitude and longitude. So here you can see, based off of the panel that I'm using, these are 240 watt panels. Uh, I can get a yield of. Uh, there we go. So 19,000 kilowatts of energy. Also, it breaks it down per month. And this is all relative to the angle and pitch that you have it in, in your model. So you can easily run through simulations of, you know, if it's a flat roof, like a lot of buildings in Philly, um, you can run through analysis of doing more panels but all flat, or doing uh, panels that are, you know, uh, 30 degrees that are, that are more, um, uh, they're going to get more solar gain, but then you have to space them out so you don't have a, uh, challenges and shading, but you have this you know, nice report of uh, all the information uh, within the model. Um, just another great plugin, and there, there's a lot in SketchUp. Um, one that you may see down here, uh, this one's called 1001 uh, Bit Tools. It's sort of uh, the, the go-to uh, architecture uh, tool set. It does simple things like, uh, you know, let's say you have a plan and you want to extrude some walls. Uh, where is it? There it is. <clears throat> so rather than drawing your lines, just pulling everything and extruding everything out, this tool has sort of a built-in thickness. So I want six inch walls and I want them eight feet high and I want to build the wall. You basically just um, draw out wherever you want your walls to be, and it'll trace and follow that path. 
Same thing with windows. Let's say you have a couple windows here. You can select those two faces, click on the uh, create window frame. You have the option to create a rectangular win window, a beveled, uh, recessed. Um, you can do louvers in here really quick. There's a roof rafter plugin. Again, this is called Thousand and One Bit. Um, there's a staircase one, which is very cool. I hated trying to build these in SketchUp. Um, also, just other resources just to, to be aware of uh, um, for content. Do a lot of you use the 3D Warehouse? Or anybody not know what the 3D Warehouse is? So, um, the 3D Warehouse is uh, basically a free online repository of SketchUp models. This is a good starting point to get uh, any kind of furniture and stuff that you need. I actually barely ever use this, um, mainly because I hate searching through and finding models because since it is a free website, anybody can sort of upload it. Um, Instead, uh, it's a little pricey, but um, I think it's well worth it. Um, this website called Form Fonts. It's a database, but uh, it's a yearly or monthly subscription. Um, I think for two years, it's a little over $230 or something like that. But you, you get 30 downloads a day, so you can really build up a library fast. Um, you know, even if you have a couple people chip in, uh, just starting uh, to create a library of models. Um, <clears throat> the great thing about this is their, their models are a lot cleaner, so when you try to do renderings, um, they're not um, hogs like some other uh, um, content providers where they just really slow down uh, your model. Um, and they have a lot of good furniture here as well. So, um, you know, everything from 2D components like uh, uh, people that, that base you to trees, exercise equipment, you know, any, any kind of uh, model that you need is really here. Um, so, um, one last thing just with plugins, because um, this has changed in SketchUp uh, 2013. Uh, if you go to Windows and then Extension Warehouse, this is where you can find all the plugins uh, for SketchUp. And what I can do is um, I can sort of give you an email um, of all the sort of plugins and stuff that I use uh, daily. Um, Thousand and One Bit Tools certainly is one that I use a lot. But like photorealistic plugins like Podium I use, that's a, a really cheap plugin. Um, to create uh, photorealistic models, um, just to give you an idea. And I know a lot of these, uh, specifically I know like uh, Podium, they do have educational licenses, I believe, so um, it, it might be something to look into um, for your computer labs here as well. Uh, there's other ones like, uh, like V-Ray, um, which is a little bit more expensive, but uh, produces some high quality renderings. Um, I'll open the floor and ask any, any questions that you might have. Okay. This uh, thousand and one bit one? Um, not really. It's more. It's it's a little bit more simpler. It's really the, the plugin itself is really uh, just based off of creating some uh, essential drawing tools like the doors and windows um, and louvers and, and uh, um, rafters. So it's it's not as complex. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, this though, it'll give you more control of, like, let's say on this wall here, I have this, um, this opening here, right? And I want to create a window. 
that is uh, with a rectangle bevel. I want three rows and three columns, and I can you know adjust all of the, the variations here. It just really to build this in SketchUp on its own would be a, a lot of time, and, and this certainly saves a ton of time to really kind of develop all that detail because you don't. At the end of the day, you know, you're working on a studio project. You don't want to spend an hour or two modeling the details of a window like this when it's only going to be in a rendering that you're doing that's like this far away. So it just gives that level of detail that you need and does uh, yeah, it pretty quickly. Um, have you used the layout feature of SketchUp 8? Yes, I actually I didn't get into layout at all. Um, anybody familiar with layout? Just a few. So um, layout is basically uh, like the paper space of SketchUp. It's uh, it's not a um, it's not like a construction document sort of paper space. Um, I think I have an example on here that I can show. Or maybe I can click on create one real quick. Um, yeah, uh, layout basically it, it's it's pretty simple to just to do animations and just to our uh, annotations and dimensioning for your model. Um, it's really critical on when you save scenes. So you know you can save preset scenes like this, like maybe a, a top view with uh, parallel projections. So I have two scenes saved in my model. You can send that to layout. Layout. It might take a second for this to load, um, and then I can show you. It. But uh, it's really easy to set up. Uh, have, you, have you used it, or? I just played around with it a little bit. We were deciding whether it was worth getting SketchUp buying the full version of SketchUp eight for that reason. Okay. Um, yeah, it really depends on what your what your workflow is. Like if you're um, if you need to do dimensions and annotate sort of section cuts, then yeah, it certainly is. Um, I know there is educational license, so you, um, you don't have to spend the, you know, $500 for the, for the full license. Um, but uh, in college, I, I, I didn't use it much at all, um, only because I typically either brought that into Illustrator um, or just did uh, my plans in Photoshop then after touching them up. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's basically you create a, a paper, a paper space, and there's a bunch of video resources online. I can certainly uh, send you the links. Um, but you can you know create any sort of a, a template that you like. It brings in a viewport of your model. Uh, what's nice is you can double click and basically change your view, alter your view that you have in your model. Uh, you can't, like in uh, paper space in uh, AutoCAD, you can enter that view and make changes. Here, it's, it's only allowing you to orbit into those. If you make changes in your SketchUp model, you just have to update your reference uh, in layout here. Can you set it to a scale? Yep, so like if I, let's say this one here, in your, um, so we're 11 by 17 sheet of paper, uh, on the side here, there's a SketchUp uh, model tab here where you can select specific scenes that you have. So that second scene that we saved was a top view. So you can see it says top view. And then instead of current scale, you can just adjust that to whichever scale that you want. So 16 times is a little small. Let's try, let's try eight. So after you set your scale, up top here is your label and annotation tool and your dimensioning tool. So I can click on that and you actually can measure your distances from your SketchUp model. And there are, there are uh, sort of styles to these. So 
right now this is sort of just like the default style, but you have full control um, of you know what the dimensioning style is for this. Don't want it in meters. There's also um, this uh, scrapbook, which it gives you your essential sort of title block and uh, sort of elements like. You know, if you need a, a title block or a, um, a notes there, gives you, you know, if you're doing a section cut, you can do that. Let me show which elevation you're doing. You know, so it has a lot of these built in, so you don't have to create all these from scratch. set up, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. It's been a while since I've used this. Um, there used to be a way you could set up the quality. Yeah. So rendering resolution. So your output quality, you, know, you don't want as medium. You want that at, at high. But as you're modifying and editing it, you can set it to low, it's just going to make it a little bit faster to run. And that's really what that auto set kind of helps do as well. Any other questions? Um, great resource, just uh, so you have it. Um, go to youtube.com backslash sketchup video. SketchUp video is the username or the channel that SketchUp uh, has. So this, these are all videos directly from SketchUp. It's a great starting point. Um, when I started learning SketchUp, um, I didn't think YouTube existed yet, but um, they had videos on their website that really um, you know, we're tool specific. So there's a there's a getting started, there's like a toolbar series, and I just went through each tool and really understood how each tool works individually. And then as you work through, you, you know, your your project workflow, you know, you'll find ways in which to model things uh, a little bit easier. Um, I guess my last tip of advice uh, when you're modeling in SketchUp, uh, just remember what your end end result is. Uh, in studio, I would spend hours modeling detail for something that, you know, I modeled the back of the building, but I only showed two renderings from the front two angles. So I wasted, you know, four or five hours doing the back of the model that, you know, the professor never saw. So as you're, as you're building your models and, and developing things, you know, I don't want to say cut corners, but you know, make good use of your time. That way, you can focus on a, a lot of the details that you need to create in certain views. But then also, um, you know, you can hide your mistakes. 